in which case we're going to start right now. So um, welcome everyone to our talk on who owns this code. Um, my name is Claire Dillon and ironically I'm not the person wearing the Dublin t-shirt, though I am from Dublin, Ireland. Um, I am a researcher with Lero, which is Science Foundation's Ireland's National Software Centre, so Research Centre for Software Development. Um, I'm also uh, a community lead at Curious, which is a community for University and Research Institution OSPOS, um, and I'm also a board member of InnerSource Commons. Um, my, I suppose, pathway to open source came through InnerSource. So I'm going to present now, let Tom do his introduction. Here we go. Thanks, Claire. Yeah. Uh, Tom Sadler, uh, Principal Engineer at BBC, focusing on connected TV apps and open source and inner source. Uh, and yeah, um, also working with Claire in the inner source Commons, uh, also serving on the board. Thank you, Tom. And we're here today to talk about code ownership concepts and specifically in the context of collective software development efforts. Um, it's a topic that actually led me to start my PhD um, research. So this was the, one of the topics that I am particularly curious about. Um, and Tom and I have had so many discussions about this in the past. So we're going to have, this is going to be a three-parter. It's going to be me giving you a little bit of an overview of code ownership to date about what we've discovered and set the groundwork. Tom Tom is going to give some real hands-on practical experience in terms of how they manage that at the BBC. And the third part is interactive. Maybe we'll have some questions from the audience. Maybe you'll share some experiences. We hope we get there if we keep moving on time. We're going to start by defining ownership and code ownership because actually it's like one of those, you know, elephants where, where it depends on what part of the animal you're actually patting, it might mean something different to you. So the question would be is, if I said to any of you who owns the code you're working on, what pops to mind? Are, are, are you thinking of one of many things? Are you thinking about one person? Are you thinking about one team? Are you thinking about what does she mean when she says, who owns this code? I've never even thought about that question in my life. But the real answer is that it depends. So there are many ways to think about <laughs> code ownership. One is the legal way, right? So, you know, who's holding the IP rights? Who's deciding what licenses are in place? Um, who decides to change those licenses when you may not want them to? Um, so who is the legal owner of the code? That, of course, may be very different from who authored the code. Interestingly, it turns out in some of the research I'll share later that the authorship is actually the measurement they use in some research studies to show who actually owns the code. So who has authored it? Who has contributed to it? When? Who makes decisions about the code? Who is deciding its future direction? Who is deciding who gets to decide who, where the future direction is going? So who, who owns the code in that respect? Whose responsibility is it? Something goes wrong, you're getting a call at 2 a.m., Who's on the other end of the line? The hotline. So who's responsible for that code? Who maintains it? Who is the person who's in the hot seat when something goes wrong? And most interestingly, maybe none of those things actually matter. Because it turns out, research says, there's a psychological feeling. It may never be written anywhere. Your name may not be on a document or a governance anything, but you feel an ownership to this code somehow, some way, it's part of you. That is actually a well-known phenomenon and often not documented or talked about, but something that should be considered when we're thinking about the implications of code ownership. So also there's this idea of individuals ownership. When some people have uh, used developer portals, they insist on a name being put beside each project. The one person who rules it all, they are the person that controls everything about that project. But is that really fair in a team environment? Maybe it's a team, but if a team name is up there, then how the hell do you know who to call at 2 a.m. in the morning? Because no one's got a phone number beside the team name. So is it a team? Is it an individual? Is it weak or strong, hard or soft? This speaks to the formality around the ownership, management, or governance you may have in your organization. And there is a tendency for certain types of projects to maybe have more weak ownership, and sometimes to have more strong ownership, and there are potentially pros and cons to each. And here's a real one, because ownership, code ownership, it's kind of like being a parent, right? It kind of never ends, you know, like, you know, but it also changes over time. Like once you have a baby, like you have a responsibility, you've birthed it into the world, and there's a responsibility, legal and otherwise, but that can actually change over time. 
both your legal responsibility, your responsibility for them in general, who gets called at 2am in the morning when something gets wrong, goes wrong. That all changes with children and it changes with code too. So one thing to keep in mind is that just because ownership is set at a given point in time, there is a question about how that changes over time and what you've put in place to manage that change. Other factors influencing code ownership. One is definitely the origin of the project. So it turns out that in the open source community, there may be more uh, projects that are out there that might have more weak ownership, maybe nothing formal put in place. In a corporate environment, perhaps there is a more coming from a strong ownership perspective, though, though maybe not all, also. So this is not necessarily a given, but it is a consideration to think about uh, where is the origin of the project and therefore what ownership practices you may want to actually put in place. Another one is definitely the project type. So it does, does really mean the context matters. So when we talk about ownership, sometimes we have to think about what is the right ownership model or right ownership governance, depending on the type of project. Because it's not, again, one answer to rule them all. It depends on whether the project perhaps is a critical piece of infrastructure versus something that's telling you the bus schedules in your local town. Well, maybe not in your local town, because that'd be pretty critical, but maybe certainly in terms of some sort of community-based project that it doesn't really matter if it goes down at 2 a.m. in the morning. It can wait until after the weekend to sort that out versus some critical infrastructure. You may want to have different governance or ownership models depending on that. And then often that ownership practice can change as the project matures and that that is something you have to watch out for. It's possibly not a good idea to enforce strong ownership models on every project from the very get-go because the overhead of doing that may actually stall the initial collaboration that's happening. Um, but as it matures and grows, that may be more appropriate. And last, the factors influencing open ownership can often be the community of end users themselves. So perhaps you may have an idea about the type of ownership model you want to put in place, your company want, wants to put in place, maybe the lawyers in your company wants to put in place, and then there is what the expectations are of the end users. And sometimes it needs an actual recognition of the fact that the end users may have an opinion in this and actually may want to be involved because of those decisions that you make are actually impacting them, and you want buy-in for those decisions in an open source project, then perhaps you may want to make sure that you actually take those people into consideration when you're thinking about ownership and who makes all the decisions about a project. So that's just a little flavor of how complex a topic it is. Like it really isn't a field you fill in on a developer portal to say, that's the, now we've done it, we've tackled ownership. There's, a, there's an owner for every project in my company, we're all tickety-boo, let's just go home. No, it is a complex matter, it is something that deserves a little bit of attention. So what does the research say on this? Now, I am not going to give you a full systematic literature view of everything about code ownership. I have not done a systematic literature of everything to do with code ownership, but I have got a number of papers here that I felt were particularly interesting in this topic. So I'll just share a few of them, and you can read them later in detail. The first one was one of the first ones I came across, which is by Bird et al. And uh, it's actually called Don't Touch My Code, which kind of shows you where that was coming from. Um, it was done about uh, in Microsoft around the actual Windows Vista and Windows 7 releases. And they were looking at, well, what are, what's the relationship between strong code ownership and fault, faults and, and, and bugs in the code? And they found that there was an actual correlation between what they called strong ownership um, and with, for, so for example, a small number of expert developers creating the code, and there was a strong relationship between that and the quality of the code. And they were suggesting that as you increased the number of low expertise developers contributing to the code, that actually increased the number of faults that were there in the code. So as a result, they suggested prioritizing QA resources for low ownership components, so for things where people didn't have that kind of strong ownership uh, associated with it, to perhaps limit contributions from low expertise developers, and perhaps to implement increased testing and more stringent quality controls for low, low ownership code, and to encourage higher, stronger levels of ownership. Now, interesting, because when I first saw this, I went, ooh, I don't know, that's really great for like open source projects, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's literally what we don't want to do. We want to actually encourage contributions from people. We want to enable contributions in some projects. So does that mean that therefore there's a correlation between having widely 
you know, loads of contributors and lo less quality code. Um, they would, this paper kind of suggests, well, maybe there is, but maybe you want to mitigate against it. However, because research is research and it's wonderful, we can see, look at all angles of it. There is another paper that says, that's an interesting thing. There may be a correlation between strong ownership of code and code quality. But actually, it's not as strong a correlation as other important metrics, like, for example, the lines of code or how complex it is, the number of modifications a piece of code has undergone over time, or indeed the number of developers. Um, so there is definitely something that I think we all need to be aware of to say that when there are more people involved in a project, in any kind of collaborative project, open source or even proprietary code, it does raise the risk of more bugs or faults being put into the code. And you do need to consider that. And perhaps it might be interesting to consider the idea that you would put different stipulations in place for people who are perhaps not considered to be owners or strong owners of the code or authors of the code to actually others, but you just have to pay particular attention to it. The next piece of research is actually by um, Daniel. Is Daniel here? No, no, he didn't even come. The Daniel is one of our other board manners for Inner Source Commons, but he, I put this in because he wrote he was one of the authors on the paper, but also because it's a good paper. Um, but this one was actually looking at who fixes bugs. And I thought this was really interesting because, you know, my previous um, kind of assumption would be, well, if strong ownership is good and therefore the authors are the people who are, you know, should be creating the modifications and then that's creating less faulty code, well then obviously they're the ones obviously fixing the bugs that they put in, aren't they? I mean, like the, 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 the authors, the owners from an authorship perspective are probably the ones doing all the fixes, but no, they're not. Turns out 80% of the cases, the bug fixing, and well, first of all, it involves source code that was modified by at least two devs. So that is suggesting that there's more modifications going on in, in, the, in the code that needs to be fixed. But in most cases, the developers who fix bugs in open source projects are not the developers who wrote the actual project in the first place. So now what we're saying is that maybe the people who are best placed to maintain and be responsible for fixing code may not be the original authors. So the question that leads from that is, are they involved in the decision-making process about the architectural decisions in the future? Because these folks, obviously, even if they didn't, weren't the original authors, they may not be the benevolent dictators for life, but they may be the people who are best placed to fix code in the future. Though maybe they don't want to get called at 2 a.m. in the morning, who knows, I don't, don't know about that. Lastly, this paper is around the practice and perception of team code ownership. So if you do want to engender this idea of having more than one person feel responsible for the code, have pride in their code, have this idea of a collective um, ownership and have that really work in your organization, then this paper talks about the fact that it's not a policy. You know, writing someone's name in a document somewhere or in a portal somewhere does not in itself make people feel more ownership of the code. And in a really healthy collaborative development environment, you want lots of people having that ownership feeling and feeling pride in it. And therefore they really need to understand the system context. They need to understand more about the code. They need to, uh, uh, contribute to the code. The people who do that most are, are, you know, have feelings of ownership. They have to have a, a perception of code quality. No one wants to be associated or to own the buggy code. Obviously, they want to own code that they feel is a good level of quality. They want to have a belief in the value and they want to have high team cohesion. So collaboration wants to be good within that team. They're the factors that contribute to high levels of team, perceived team ownership. So I'm just going to go into now some of the areas where that can be taken too far because to date, or up until right now in this presentation, we've been talking about how it's good to have clear ownership, how that can lead to strong ownership, perhaps leads to better quality, at least clarity about who owns what and who's responsible for what is always good. Clarity is always good. But there are times when ownership can be kind of taken too far. So this idea of toxic ownership or excessive ownership is a topic that came up uh, that I first heard of in Inner Source Commons. And it was coming up all the time. People were like putting a whole range of issues under this idea of toxic ownership. So what does it mean? And I guess like any strength, strengths can be overplayed. And if you overplay a strength, it can sometimes bring you into a toxic 
bad behaviour that limits collaboration and limits good software development. So I'm just going to briefly go through some of those scenarios that we've talked about. The first is legal, right? So obviously, we, we know that it's important to have clear legal understanding about what's happening with your code. You need to have your license. You need to decide what license it is. There is a phenomenon, though, whereby people are, you know, there's, the, the, there's obviously the notion of being as open as possible and as closed as necessary. Sometimes in organizations, they kind of flip that and they're like, do you know what? Don't want to be worrying about anything, so we'll just be as closed as possible and really only do open by exception. If you're in that kind of environment, that really is a kind of a excessive ownership scenario because there really needs to be clear criteria in place for when and why you might want to open because there's loads of value in that. But if people are taking the stance of as closed as possible, they're really probably not clear about when and why open is better, both from an inner source and, and op uh, open source perspective. The second is identity, right? Talked about the psychological feeling of ownership. That can go a little bit too far. We've certainly heard stories of people who either as an individual or as a team are like, this is my baby, it's my precious. No one's good enough to touch my precious. No one's as clever as me. No one's worthy of my code. All of that psychological feeling is partly because people's, people are feeling an identity with the things that they own that makes it part of them. And if you're actually suggesting that you're going to share that, then you're asking them to share part of themselves. And it feels like that to people. So don't underestimate the potential passive blocking that can happen from people who have an overdeveloped sense of identity attached to code. Then there's the idea of control, right? It's kind of like, you know, we're going to put all these regulations in place. We're going to put the we're going to have this legal review in place. And if you want to do anything, you go through the five million forms, three separate review committees, and all the other things that we're going to put in your way before you actually get to contribute. And sometimes this control can be explicit, or it can be kind of again passive and hidden, where it's just really putting blockers in places for people. And it's really a symptom of wanting to control the situation, perhaps too much control, um, that can again hamper any collaborative effort. And then there's the decision making. Now, sometimes this is in best intentions, like people, people want to contribute into decision making, but they're always contributing their point of view, right? All this feedback is always subjective. People are coming at it from different perspectives. There are people who are really trying to manage consensus among a group of people who may want very different things. And that's hard. So there is a scenario where whoever gets to make the decisions has to be good at consensus and building consensus. Um, and, and really, you can't always make all of the people happy all of the time. But then that too can sometimes turn into kind of bad behaviors where there is this idea of, you know, okay, it's really complicated. You wouldn't understand. All these priorities are so hard. I'll just put your issue at the back of the queue because they don't want to deal with it. So there is a, a, a kind of a criteria or something to look at around decision making and code ownership that would suggest that you really have to be transparent about how you're making decisions, even if you're not, if everyone's not involved in that decision making process. And then lastly, um, I'm just going to say about responsibility because it really is important for people to be clear about who's, who's responsible for code at any given point in the time frame of the, of the cycle of a code project. Um, and what you don't want is the scenario of anyone developing something and either not caring enough to actually maintain it, uh, or in fact, you know, really not wanting to take any contributions on because they're afraid that that will put a maintenance burden on them. So there's all sorts of issues around the actual maintenance and the responsibility around that you need to address. So, in terms of avoiding toxic ownership, I think there's kind of three main areas that we talk about focusing on. One is about convincing people about why accountability matters and clarification about who owns what and who's responsible for what and what's happening and how the processes work, incredibly important. And then to communicate that consistently, because you might have it written in a document somewhere, but if no one knows about it, then what's the point in having a document somewhere? So really about how within an organization and within a project, are you communicating consistently and over time so that everyone kind of knows what's happening, knows who the owners are, and what that means in any given scenario. So now I'm going to pass on to Tom, who's going to tell us about how that's working in practice in the BBC. Tom, all yours. Cool, thanks, Claire. 
Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you about um, the connected TV applications that we make at the BBC. Um, so we have iPlayer and Sounds, which are our um, video streaming and audio streaming services. Uh, we have five teams that are working together on the TV applications um, and like, the way we do ownership and source is a big way about uh, how we manage to work together. So um, a few years ago, this is what our code architecture looked like. Um, <laughs> over time, maybe most code ends up like this. But um, yeah, obviously this was a big problem. Like our TV applications are quite complex um, and we'd been essentially using the same code base for, well now it's been 10 years of, of evolving the same code base. Um, and kind of to, to Claire's point before about code quality, um, ownership isn't the only factor in code quality, um, but we felt basically unable to refactor this because it wasn't clear who owned what bit of the code base. So when product features came in or any kind of maintenance work to the code base, developers would just work on as small a bit of the problem as possible and just kind of leave the, the kind of here be dragon stuff. Um, so because there wasn't that sense of responsibility, there wasn't that sense of ownership, uh, this just got worse and no one was taking responsibility to clean it up. So we implemented ownership um, by grouping areas of the product and areas of specialism. So uh, we have kind of uh, browse and playback UI, which is just a way of splitting up the, the user interface side of the code base uh, between um, the, the two disciplines. Uh, we have media playback team, which is kind of the nuts and bolts of how to how to do media playback on TV devices, because that's an interesting specialist area. Uh, build and launch infrastructure. So you might call this a DevOps team. Um, we don't because kind of there's backend components that all the teams own and we expect them to work in a DevOps way and, and, and deliver end to end. Um, but yeah, that's your kind of your shared infrastructure, your tooling, um, things like that. And then account and app core, another kind of UI team, um, but app core, um, was kind of given to this team because the account and sign-in area of the UI was uh, a bit smaller. Um, so they, they were given the rest of the stuff as well. And this is a bit of a special case. Um, and actually, this probably, probably wasn't the best ownership model to just kind of give uh, all of the shared glue code and, and client-side frameworks to, to one team. Uh, and we have done something about that. I'll talk to you about that in a bit. Um, but yeah, that was separate from build and launch, so it's like back and front end kind of split. Um, and I don't know who, uh, how many of you are familiar with Conway's law, but um, essentially it's saying that your code architecture will match your organisational structure. And we kind of, we, we the way we uh, approach our code ownership, we kind of, we talk about leveraging Conway's law because you kind of, you want a good separation of concerns, you want sensible um, sort of business logic to, you know, have separations and, uh, and work together with nice interfaces. So our team structure is like consciously like, well, what makes sense from our code architecture? So it's like a, it's kind of a feedback loop of what team structure makes sense for the code base, but what code base makes sense for the team structure. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, our ownership principles, how we implement it and some of the culture around it. So, owners are responsible for development, testing, maintenance, and deployment and operations. So this is what I was saying about we work in a DevOps way. Um, this means that uh, there's a lot of clarity around who's responsible both at 2 a.m., um, but also as product features come in, uh, as I don't know, security patches, bug fixes, anything like that. Uh, grouped into teams, so kind of what I was saying before um, about the domains. Uh, so, um, and one of the important things here is the team mission kind of comes back to that emotional ownership side. Like, if if you're not bought in to the code, like if your if your team mission is to make the best playback experience in the world on TVs, um, and you get given a piece of backend infrastructure that's you know, doing DDoS protection or something, you're just like, well, what's that got to do with making the best playback user, user experience. So aligning ownership around team mission leverages that kind of emotional uh, ownership that, that Claire was talking about. Uh, defined in terms of teams and individuals. Um, so we don't want single points of failure. We don't want silos of knowledge. 
um, and then to deal with the kind of who do you call out at 2 a.m. We have uh, rotors but in, in the teams, but um, yeah, we, we, we want to avoid kind of hero developers, as it were, uh, and make sure that there is collective ownership within a team. And um, this one's really important and near and dear to my heart, but supporting inner source contributions. So we find that by explicitly saying to teams like, yes, you own this area of the code base, you're the go-to people. However, you are expected to support collaboration in that area. Um, because if you don't have that expectation, you risk drifting into the toxic ownership side of things. What you're, what you're doing by having this principle is like, your doors are open, you're open to contributions, you're open to working with the other teams when they need to touch your code base. Um, and also uh, responsible for open source in the domain, and I'll go into a bit more detail about that later, um, but essentially it's, it's around domain expertise and actually we want to we want the domain experts to work with the open source in their domain as well. In terms of implementation, it's actually quite straightforward. Um, we have all our code on GitHub. We use code owners, branch protection. Um, so anytime a pull request is raised, uh, the code owners get pinged. So as long as our code owners file is up to date, we have this kind of fairly clear, um, fairly visible. Uh, we also use AWS resource tagging so that we have that kind of ownership uh, clear in the infrastructure, in the sort of deployed components as well. Um, so that's also useful because you might not always get a one-to-one -one mapping of code to deployed component or deployed service. So uh, AWS resource tagging helps, helps with uh, budget reports as well. So we know what team we need to shout out for spending too much money. Um, and in terms of culture, so I talk like the, the inner source, um, the, the inner source principle that we, that we follow is one part of it, but there's just, you kind of need a whole, a whole company culture of collaboration and working together. Um, you don't want to be like, it's, it's going to be, well, I imagine I've not worked in a place like this, but I imagine it'd be really difficult to implement something like this. Uh, if you were in a kind of zero sum game, one upmanship kind of, you know, my victory is my personal victory. It's not a collaborative victory. So one of the key BBC principles is that we are one BBC. We collaborate, learn, and grow together. So the fact that we have a corporate culture of collaboration really helps this. Um, and even if you don't have this, then maybe your sort of local leadership can try and hammer this into uh, to the local team culture. Um, so hard versus soft ownership. So Claire touched on this, and I, th I think actually. Um, I think this might be a slightly different angle on this, um, but essentially we we um, didn't like talking about weak versus strong ownership, um, and we found that hard versus soft was a more um, a, a more useful way of describing different ownership models and I suppose different levels of openness. So um, when I'm going through some of these models, um, most of the people here probably familiar with these terms being with being an open source but um, yeah open source and inner source both use these terms contributors are people who contribute to the code base raise pull requests trusted committers additionally have uh, permissions to merge pull requests maybe commit directly to the main branch if that's a workflow that's supported and then maintainers are the ones that as well as having commit rights also drive the kind of vision of the project forwards um, so I'm going to talk in, in, in those terms when we're looking at the, the ownership models. So if you take like an extreme hard ownership model, um, the owners, or I suppose the maintainers, to use the open source term, the owners are the only people that change in the code base. And your people dependent on that code and stakeholders are throwing requirements at them. And that's kind of it. Sometimes, sometimes in very specialised areas, you might want to do this. Um, I think Claire was saying about un, like people with low experience in a domain potentially harming code quality. Um, so, like uh, I mentioned, media playback on TVs being a bit of a, an interesting, weird area. So, some some bits of our code base we have a fairly hard ownership model, um, but even then, we try and encourage different sorts of collaboration, uh, cross team pairing, um, developer exchanges, and things like that. Medium ownership is kind of your typical inner source looking thing. So this is where we have contributors um, as well as uh, maintainers and trusted committers. So 
people interested in software are raising contributions, not just raising requirements, but they might also raise requirements for the core team to be, uh, to be working on. And then you kind of extreme soft ownership. Um, that's where it's a bit of a free for all. Um, this didn't work for us, like we saw with that dependency diagram. Um, but there might be some cases where actually, if you have good governance um, around this, this kind of free for all, if if everybody if everybody has commit rights, uh, yeah. In some cases, this can work, but for us, we found it caused quite a lot of tech debt. So what this actually looks like in terms of the team structure is this. Um, so I've not got I've not got kind of contributors separate because we do have an inner source model, so everyone is a potential contributor, but we have all the maintainers in one team. Like this is reasonably strong ownership, but we're open to collaboration, uh, we're open to contributions, so it's not kind of full hard, it's kind of medium hard, I guess. Um, in an ideal world, you might want something that looks a bit more like this, where the teams that are contributing, you're kind of within your inner source community, um, you might want trusted committers to be in, in those teams so that, that when they when they are when those teams are working in your area they can have a bit more autonomy um, and not rely on the owning team or the maintainer team to review every pull request um, but this isn't something we've really managed to make happen yet um, but it's something i see come up uh, in kind of the broader inner source community quite a bit uh, and then finally there's the kind of distributed soft ownership but with a kind of governance model in place um, so I mentioned about app core so we've started doing this for our app core now because like I said it didn't make sense for one team to own all the shared code so we now have a virtual team um, a combination of maintainers and trusted committers uh, and this means that there are there are still nominated individuals who are responsible for maintaining the health of the project and kind of driving the direction forwards. And there's also trusted committers across the different teams that depend on AppCore. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, this enables a lot more team autonomy. It spreads the shared code around. Um, this is still relatively new, so I think we might find some hurdles as we go along. Uh, but as long as these people are given time by their team to work on it and they're not constantly pulled into their teamwork, uh, this should work well and it's worked well so far. So in terms of uh, what we found, the benefits and the cons of hard ownership is you get a lot of expertise because you're just constantly working in one domain um, and you become a specialist in that area. Really clear operational support because you know who's responsible. Um, and also like uh, at least in, in our team structures because it's like one team owns it it's really clear who the other disciplines supporting it are so um, delivery or project managers we call them delivery managers uh, or product owners things like that whereas um, in the distributed model you might not have that uh, support from other disciplines within the business the cons are it's really hard to scale because you've only got a few people that can actually commit to the code Silos, um, yeah, kind of typical problem with proprietary closed um, non-inner source or open source software. Uh, and bottlenecks, again, like if you've only got one team working on it, if, if most of the work has to be done in that ownership area, then that team like, is not going to be able to scale up, it's not going to be able to have the throughput, and then everyone else is going to get held up. And then soft ownership, the pros are flexibility and scale, um, but then you have this risk of somebody else's problem. Um, so that's what we saw with cleaning up our code architecture before we implemented ownership. No one was refactoring the code because it's like, well, it's not, it's somebody else's problem. Um, and also like the slower decision-making, like either because no one's, no one's driving the, the vision of the software, um, or in fact, if too many people are kind of trying to throw their voices in and you don't have a good decision-making model around that, um, you might just end up with sort of 50 people in a room with 50 different opinions. Uh, and I said I'd talk about open source responsibilities kind of for the domain experts. So uh, the open source strategy for the BBC is um, framed around these three themes um, from hearing from um, 
uh, people in the OSPO community and things like that. I think this is quite a familiar pattern because there's Embrace, which is consuming open source, participating, which is giving back, getting involved in the community, and creating, which is where you're, you're open sourcing your own code. And uh, the way that plays into ownership for us is the domain experts, um, the, the, the people who look after a particular area of code are responsible for the um, for con consuming the, that open source software in a responsible way, making sure that it's supported, making sure the license is appropriate, um, you know, keeping keeping versions up to date for security patches. Um, and I've put a screenshot of our uh, FOSS usage decision record. So this is kind of a, a framework that we've um, introduced. We've not kind of mandated it. It's more like here's a tool you might want to use. Um, but this kind of is giving teams um, a way of uh, understanding like what, what do I need to worry about? What do I need to think about when I'm taking on a new open source dependency? In terms of participating, um, so yeah, again, you own your relationship with your open source dependencies or that team does. Um, so you want, you know, we're expecting owning teams to be getting involved in discussions on like, if there's a Slack channel or GitHub issues or mailing lists, whatever it might be, uh, con contributing upstream um, and also attending community events. Um, I'd say we're, f we're fairly new on this part. Um, we've made a lot of progress in this part uh, over the past year or so, but um, yeah, th this is th this is what we want to work towards, and um, we're starting to see starting to see this happening, uh, especially with support of kind of mid-level managers who are telling their team leads like being a team lead for this ownership area means you need to be interacting, um, and this is just th this was the first pull request that we got merged with one of our um, playback dependencies. Uh, as we have started to, to implement this model now. And create, um, so this means that like when there is BBC open source libraries, it's clear who needs to respond to the community and look after the community. Because like s some open source projects kind of do get abandoned as reorgs happen or as people move on. So um, Big Screen Player is one example of one of our open source projects. Um, but because we have ownership around media playback, um, it's clear like who is responsible for making sure that that is a healthy open source community. Pull requests aren't getting ignored, issues aren't getting ignored, the documentation is good, all that sort of thing. So to summarise, benefits and risks. So clarity, especially operationally. Autonomy, teams don't have to have 50 different people to sign off on a decision. Expertise, um, you know what you need to know. You need to know your ownership area for your team. Uh, anything else is a bonus. Uh, Buy-in, emotional ownership. Um, encourages good architecture. Um, at least the way we've done it seems to work for us. Uh, code quality, although, yeah, you do, you do potentially lose out on that many eyes that you get with open source or kind of broader inner source projects. Um, but yeah, compared to no ownership. Um, and certainly in our experience, we found it improves code quality. And then risks, uh, toxic ownership and silos, you have to get the culture right. Uh, catch all ownership areas like App Core was in the past. On paper ownership, if someone's given something to own, but they don't actually work on it, don't know anything about it, it's basically like no ownership and it's not gonna get maintained properly. Um, uneven distribution, so inner source solves this to, cert to a certain extent, but if all, the, if all the work is happening in one team, then that team's going to become overburdened and, and overstretched. Uh, fuzzy boundaries, so that's just where ownership can get a little bit difficult. Maybe, maybe at the fuzzy boundaries you just need a soft, a soft ownership or kind of fully shared and distributed ownership. Uh, and yeah, misaligned with team mission. If people, people aren't bought in, they're, they're not going to care about it. Uh, and finally, yeah, as, as your org structure evolves, uh, you need to revisit your ownership model. Like if you keep your ownership model static and your org structure changes, you're going to get unowned code. Things are going to fall through the cracks and you're going to fall into the traps. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you.
So we may have started on time, but I think you saw the Irish and English like not quite keep to time as much as we wanted to. Um, but we do have time for maybe one or two questions if we can be, you know, cheeky enough to take a little bit of the transfer time. So if anyone has a question. Hello. How do you handle the uh, relationship between paying for commercial support or paying for an external consultant to maintain something on your behalf in order to accelerate a roadmap in a particular direction? Um, so, to be honest, I've not got a huge amount of experience of that. Um, when we have had contractors, they've been contractors that get embedded in teams. Um, but um, actually, I think we, we try and build most of our stuff in-house for, for that exact reason. So. I don't have a good answer, I'm afraid, because I've not really had much experience. How about you, Claire? Yeah, I don't have a specific experience of that, but I, I know that there has been discussions about, um, you know, the, the, the statements of work and things like that that people are using with um, uh, third party organisations to help, certainly with this idea of ownership over time and what that means. And like, for example, to enable things like inner source over a longer period of time, then that sometimes actually changes the actual relationship with the vendor um, that might be providing contracting services. So it is, it is an area that people are looking at, but it's not one that I think has been matured yet in any anywhere that I've seen anyway. Anyone else? No? Well then we, we oh you're you're all very good at finishing up on time. So I'm just going to give you two more things. If you are interested in learning more about inner source and that particular topic, the use of open source methods internally for proprietary code, there's two more sessions that are coming up during the week. Tomorrow, Russ Rutledge, who's the executive director of Inner Source Commons, has an ex ask the expert session at 335. And you'll see Russ and Tom and myself back at a panel discussion on Wednesday at 405, uh, where we'll be talking about inner source program offices, open source program offices, similarities, differences, what they all mean. We hope to see you there. Thank you all very much. Thank you.